Go ahead. All right, welcome to uh, the Ordinance Committee uh, on Thursday, March 15th, the Ides of March 2018, here at uh, Council Chamber A. Um, Tracy, would you do a, um, an attendance, please? Yep, Councilor Rowan. Here. Council Katarina. Here. Council Chair Donovan. Present. Thank you. Um, approval of minutes, November 2nd, 2017. I need to pass on those because I wasn't on the council at that point. So. Move approval. Second. All in favor? One abstention. Should All the, right. Should the minutes reflect that there was a, a Shakespeare reference and an ordinance committee meeting? <laughs> Today is the Ides of March, I know it is. and I'm I used to. Uh, when I was a Latin teacher, we used to celebrate it every year. We used to, anyway, don't ask. I suspect it's <laughs> the only Shakespeare reference ever offered at the Ordinance Committee's. Yeah. Oh, okay, we aren't going there. All right, what I would like to do today, obviously, um, I haven't been on ordinance since my previous um, council um, term. And a lot of things went on in the last year, and we met briefly, um, Mr. Hall and I, and just talked about things that maybe carried over. And what I decided to do today was at least to start discussions on we have the odor ordinance, because uh, apparently uh, there were some issues uh, with, I believe it was marijuana growth in, an, in a neighborhood. Uh, senior property tax relief program. There's been a there's a slight tweak that uh, we think may help some people um, who could use the help who live in um, mo uh, not modular home but um, manufactured. Thank you, manufactured <laughs> housing uh, areas. Uh, the mooring ordinance needs some tweaking, and Will brought up affordable rents is a potential, and then we'll talk about, I've already got one thing for the next agenda. So with no further ado, what I gave you uh, in our packet is just, and I apologize, it's a little, this is from uh, a Larissa Crockett, our assistant manager, sent me a few um, uh, snippets and, and a, actually a whole ordinance from the from the city of Denver, Colorado, uh, that was mostly, uh, it seemed to be pointed more towards uh, the, the marijuana legalization that they've done uh, out there. So it was pretty extensive. But I, I cherry-picked, I'll admit, I cherry-picked, I believe this is from the Acton uh, ordinances uh, that seemed fairly straightforward. Uh, of course, my, my concern with anything like this is that it's subjective. What smells really good to one person may not smell so great to somebody else. So um, that is why uh, I, I just picked this at least to start the discussion. And if I could ask uh, Mr. Donovan, um, could you fill me in on some of what went on last year? And briefly. <laughs> on uh, uh, good, on na good neighbor ordinance? Or? Yeah, or the whole this odor thing, and you know, I feel it probably could go into good neighbor ordinance, but yeah, I'd had, like to hear your thoughts. We had um, uh, a lady come forward who said that uh, there was uh, marijuana being grown outdoors in her neighborhood, residential neighborhood, mm -hmm. uh, and that it. Uh, uh, when they uh, harvested it, uh, there was a very strong odor. Um, I think then two of the town council members uh, did a trip down to her neighborhood to see if they could make an assessment, uh, found that it was a legitimate problem. It was strong and offensive. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a consequence, uh, uh, that was in the September time frame, and there really was no real opportunity for uh, that ordinance committee to move it forward. <clears throat> but it w and it was recognized that it's a it's a hard it's when you handle the plants right. and it's outdoors as a general rule. I think there's probably a large commercial and industrial growth indoors could be a problem, just as odors from smokestacks and whatnot can be a problem. But in this case, uh, it was an outdoor 
It was a situation where the number of people in the house were legally entitled to have the number of plants growing that they had. And I think it was under the medical marijuana uh, provisions mm -hmm. of state law. Uh, so it was because of the mix of people in the household, it was a larger number of plants than you would routinely find. But it definitely was an issue for, for this neighborhood. Uh, and so uh, at first we were thinking it's part of the marijuana legislation issue, which we were deferring. But the more we thought about it, uh, the more we said it's really a general odor issue and should be treated as such. Uh, and don't try and regulate it as a matter of marijuana uh, mm -hmm. because uh, it could, there could be any number of other odors that would create the same kind of concern. Mm -hmm. So it, given that the marijuana, it would, and these aren't, uh, uh, these aren't complaints that arise often. Uh, and they're, so they are limited to those special circumstances. No one had really any recollection of odor issues having been raised previously other than at Pine Point. They had raised it uh, coming from, uh, I think, one of the commercial growers. Uh, yeah. uh, as you head down the hill, over the trestle, yeah. down the hill, on yeah. the right, uh, <clears throat> there had been some complaints of that. Uh, so uh, I think the uh, ordinance committee at that point had October left, October, November, and it was not deemed enough time to take okay. any action. So we rolled it over to this year. Okay. Mr. Rowan, do you have anything you can Yeah, add I, th I think that? the only thing to um, add was there was also an issue with, uh, there were very small lots over, over there, so there was also uh -huh. um, uh, some concern about if we were to take the uh, regulating marijuana route, there might be an avenue or the proximity to the school. Um, but I do recall there have been other odor complaints in town. We had mm -hmm. one um, around, um, I think some sh shellfish processing down also on Pine Point, which is what I thought mm -hmm. you were referring to, which might also be you know, covered if we were to go uh, mm -hmm. an odor control or an older odor order. Are you thinking of the uh, uh, sanitary district? So we, there was this, the sanitary district one as well. I wasn't, but I, was, I, I recall, I don't know, it was probably 18 started. months ago. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There was something something down with the um, I think we remember something. Shellfish I, think processing. I think the two are related. It was a sanitary uh, district smell, but the cause of it, they believe, had a lot to do with the major processor hmm. and their contributions and loadings into the system. Uh -huh. But it wasn't emanating directly from the business. It was a byproduct into the sure. sanitary system, as I understood it. Yeah, I think the one I'm, one I'm recalling was predating the complaint okay. about the sanitary odor smell, but I, okay. I, couldn't, I couldn't specify the details of this. But I think it's fair to characterize odor complaints are rare. Yeah. 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 And, and that was going to be, Mr. Hall, I was going to ask you if you had anything to add as to, in your time as, as manager, you know, how often do we get these? Um, yeah, they're, as I said, they're, they're fairly rare here in Scarborough. I've got some prior experience in other communities where they're more prevalent mm -hmm. uh, based on odor from a, a municipally owned landfill. Oh, wow. mm -hmm. And in that case, we chose to not go the qualitative route. We actually had quantitative standards that could be measured. Difference being, we kind of knew where it, it was always coming from the same spot mm -hmm. and uh, was intense enough that it could be measured empirically. Mm -hmm. um, I think you did flag one of the big challenges is um, there's probably a subjective standard that we'll have to consider here and the uh, so-called reasonability mm -hmm. uh, is the is the threshold what a reasonable person would find is offensive or a nuisance. Mm -hmm. And uh, interestingly that sounds awfully unscientific and it is, but it's yeah. withstood I think the highest court in the land. Yeah. That that's a standard that can be used. Mm -hmm. okay. The other angle worth considering, I, it seems to me, Larissa, we did do a little research as to whether or not we could restrict outdoor grow. Uh, and I think that becomes far more challenging. There's yeah. a, a, a right under state law to um, possess plants and to cultivate them on your property, indoor or outdoor. So mm -hmm. I think that's, a, that's an avenue that we really can't pursue, at least from a medical marijuana, the recreational mm -hmm. uh, grow and 
in use is a matter that is still going through process. Okay. Um, I have a, another question, if you don't mind, right and here. this is for you, Bill. Um, the good neighbor ordinance, because that also passed while I was off the council. Mm -hmm. um, do you think something like this would fit into good neighbor ordinance? And if so, why or no? And yeah, I may be I, putting you on the spot. But. No, but I do. Th I, I think it's legitimate to ask: Is there enough of an issue to to uh, pursue uh, an odor ordinance? Mm -hmm. I think the answer is yes, but odor seems to be, I think, in some senses, trickier mm -hmm. uh, to regulate uh, in a fair way than lighting. Mm -hmm. We the. Uh, the ordinance, uh, a good neighbor ordinance, really uh, came from uh, taking what was already there <coughs> and adding the lighting mm -hmm. aspect to it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, uh, and now we're thinking about odor and qualitative versus quantitative measurement of it. Uh, so I do think we should do it. Uh, I think it belongs as a generic, uh, which is what I would characterize as a good neighbor. Whenever you're undertaking something that's offensive, mm -hmm. uh, materially offensive to the neighborhood, then uh, uh, there ought to be some ability to regulate that and ameliorate those problems. So I think it's the right place. The Good Neighbor Ordinance is based on the notion of nuisance, and in both noise and lighting, it's characterized in that in that sense. So I, I think you're quite right that odor could be similarly characterized in certain right. conditions as a nuisance. Right. I, I would point out, for lighting anyway, there is a uh, empirical is standard, one-tenth of one foot candle. So right. we do have the ability to measure performance. Yeah. Uh, whereas I think it will be exceedingly difficult to, to be able to measure did, odor performance. Did we provide an uh, empirical measure for the noise ordinance, or was that also a reasonable uh, standard? Did you have yeah, I believe did, did that decibels? Yeah, you can get decibels. I'm certain sure, sure you can. I just wasn't sure if we I did. There's, there's definitely things about, um, that are more subjective, like a consistent parking dog. So yeah. we have some language in there that is, is not um, quantifiable. Mm -hmm. but. I, I can't pull it up right now, but I would be surprised if there were not a clear decimal, at least in part of it. I believe. No, I don't believe that. There's I, I, not I, a clear I, I, decimal. Oh, no, 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 yeah, but we never went to a dB standard. Okay. Uh, oh, it's just it says which is audible. At a, there's one section um, in 4B where it mentions a minimum of 200 feet from the source of the noise, so that's something that's measured. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I, did, I, I believe that there is a way of measuring odor, too, that, but it's pretty scientific. Or <laughs> then there's other standards around uh, uh, automobile or motorcycle noise that isn't a specific standard, but it's something you can say is happening or isn't in terms of squealing of tires, revving of engines, right. things not related to the normal operation of right. the vehicle. So I, I think there's some standards that can be clearly observed and documented. And a lot of time restrictions. Those are also very clear. Mm -hmm. Were you using that power saw? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Different times. Right. Right. I, I know myself, um, just coming back to all of this and having somewhat followed what was going on last year, um, and knowing that marijuana is an ongoing and developing issue or, or policy that's supposedly going to come out of the state at some point, um, it, it wouldn't hurt to get ahead of this, uh, and as has been mentioned, um, it's not. It, it, we're not just looking at it for marijuana either. There are other sources of, of odor uh, that people would may consider um, a nuisance. Um, and I, I, I wanted to ask uh, Assistant Manager uh, Crockett, you. You, did you write this one for Acton when you were a select person? I was part of it. Okay. How did it, how did it work? 
Did it work? <laughs> Is so it I, working? <laughs> I think that one of the things that should be really clear to point out, I, I use this as an example as a counter to Denver's, right? So Denver's is extremely Oh, yeah, yeah. Action, and Acton's is, is really loose. And in part, Acton does not have any way to enforce anything. Okay. There's, okay. There, are, there are no officers. There are no, mm. right? So um, it works in that it, it at least puts in the books, you need to be careful and aware of, of odor. Yeah. when you're working this, but Axon's also a farming community. Yeah. So again, you have to kind of overlay that sort of what's an acceptable odor in a farming community is different. Right. So I think that it's a, if you want an odor, if you want to mention odor, I think it's a place to start. And I like the language as far as the description right. of the levels. Um, but I think that Scarborough has a very different community with very different lot sizes and with also questions of enforcement. And so are we asking are code enforcement officers to go out and be the normal nose? Yeah. Like, are we designating a nose? Like, right. There's, right. A, there's a difference there. Right. It, and those were all my, con if you, you want to call them concerns. With sure. This. It just occurred to me uh, in my tenure here, there's one other area that may be worth mentioning, and that has to do with smoke from oh, yeah. campfires or I you know, backyard mm -hmm. campfires. Uh, I've heard it in two instances. One, there's a, a very kind of acute situation with uh, a neighbor that has a hypersensitivity. It's almost a, a health issue, but it could be construed as odor as well. Right. Um, also, I've heard complaints from some of the campgrounds yeah. that have mm -hmm. 800 campfires every night. Yeah. So uh, again, that it may not fit perfectly, but it might be something that we find ourselves using this a odor provision to enforce. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. I remember I was on the council when that came up. And, and the state law governing open fires uh, does use the nuisance factor, and it's yeah. under that guise that public safety responds when requested. Right. And they use the reasonable standard when when they show up on scene. Uh, Larissa, you wanted to. I just want to say, like, is it is that the sort of thing that like, it's a smoke issue? Is that a particulate? Not only is that something that's it's a odor, but is, it, is the bigger concern the inhalation of the... To some, it's a true health issue that have a kind of hypersensitivity. It's a... Uh, Causes lung issue. Lung issue. Both. Yeah. But, but it's others. definitely the health side of smoke, but it's also can be a strong odor. But it, in many respects, it doesn't carry the same kind of uh, obnoxious odor characteristic that uh, that other odors do, sulfur-related odors. Yeah, but I think if you, if you would ask some residents on the lower end of Pine Point Road, well, most of us would say, boy, a campfire smells good. Yeah. But if you smell it every single night of the summer, and so much so as you've got to close your windows, I think yeah. they might do that differently, and we right. might as well. Yeah. I saw in the materials that were appended to the agenda mm -hmm. that there was these different levels of characterizing odor. Right. Did we take it? Is there anything else in there that is uh, up for consideration? As far as a, you, you say these are the different levels, but do we then say if it's level one, who cares? If it's level five? Yeah, it talks about that here, actually. It says, um, I just didn't I'm see sure it. That, I'm not sure that was in our material. I didn't see it highlighted. Yeah, we got. Yeah, I don't know. I, didn't write this I don't know what you got. I photocopied this and gave it to Tracy to put with the packet. Put so. it in with the good, good neighborhood. Yeah, I, I see the oh, levels, oh, but I don't oh, see anything other oh, than the yeah. language. No, let me, let me, let me read this to you then. Under um, this ordinance, it comes from the town of Acton. You know, it just talks about the emission of odor. As da 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 da. It says, for the purposes of this regulation, two odor measurements shall be made within a period of one hour. These measurements being separated by at least 15 minutes, and that's you know to give to see if it's like something that just blew up and then blows mm -hmm. away or whatever, and then two, an odor or odors beyond a lot line constitutes a nuisance if it unreasonably interferes with the enjoyment of life or use of property, and based on the following nuisance levels, the code enforcement officer shall exclude or restrict uses that produce or emit an odor beyond the lot line that is above a level two. Oh, okay. So it Sorry, does say three. that, yeah, you got to be a level three or above for the code enforcement. My, now, my other question on all of this is, uh, what's the penalty if someone doesn't behave or if they repeatedly? Uh, 
Do we have that as part of our good neighbor ordinance? Yep, there's a permanent provision. Okay, I'm sorry. First offense, I, $50, I, second, okay. 100, All right. third, 200, fourth, and okay. subsequent 500. So it could simply be couched in the same terms. But the thing I liked about this was you did have that. It wasn't, you know, you do have those two levels, and it's like just, you know, warning, so, so to speak, or say, well, you know, the neighbor could play, but I don't think it's an issue. But then if you've got three or four, you can take further steps or... Mm -hmm. But it, it seems simple, but I'm wondering, again, uh, this is just for the purpose of discussion, is, is it too simple? Is it too subjective? Maybe a place to start. Yeah, exactly. And so, I don't need a solution today. I'm not looking for a solution today unless you guys wanted to move something to the council, but I at least wanted to... Do. Are there, are, I guess I had another, another question just to bring up. Are there other sources of odor in town that would be, you know, immediately subjected Oh, to I can this. think of fish processing, for example, agriculture, farming. certain ag farming out in my end of the... Could be the exhaust vents from the restaurants <coughs> that are constantly yeah. emitting the cooked food smell. Somebody mm -hmm. who has a, if you are an overland trucker and you run your diesels overnight... Oh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. That's not only a noise issue for some, that would also be an odor. <coughs> yeah. Or yeah. yeah. Should you wish to consider this, we ought to talk about enforcement. Uh, Acton's um, tags the uh, code enforcement, which makes some sense. They're only here eight to five working hours, so mm -hmm. uh, there's a problem weekends and yeah. nights. So mm -hmm. by the same token, I'm not sure if the police want this responsibility <laughs> either and whether it fits neatly there. The, the value is that they're here 24-7 and can respond when the nuisance or so-called nuisance occurs. Hmm. So could say like code enforcement and or public safety officer? That's what we do for the lighting if you look above. It just says this section of the ordinance may be enforced by any code enforcement or law enforcement officer. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So it leaves it open. So what are your thoughts? Would you guys like to so think some the, more about this? Or? Yeah, I, well, yeah. I just had all I oh, all I saw was the level one through well, five. I, I I didn't see the the well. The, I missed the Tracy standard. sent me an email about this. Uh, so yeah, I would love to be able to okay. uh, have it come sure. back. Yeah. But I don't mind talking about it because it's obvious that it's it looks like Acton has a two part test. Uh, you can. Uh, you can have this numerical standard, or you can have uh, uh, an odor that constitutes a nuisance if it unreasonably interferes with the enjoyment of life or use of property. Uh, and then it goes on to say, based on the following nuisance levels, this one through five standard, the code enforcement shall exclude or restrict use that produce or emit an odor beyond level two at the lot line. So there, those are two different ways of, of of looking at it. Uh, well, th I would suggest then that we move this to April meeting. It'll give you a chance to digest it. I mean, it's not like we have a major issue that we've got to. Yeah, exactly. Are you interested enough that staff should take the time uh, to actually incorporate language largely based yes. on Actons yeah. into our good neighbor rooms just to see how it nests yes. and fits within the context? Yes, yeah, because obviously yeah. the uh, the penalty section b beneath this uh, is uh, makes reference to noise, noise violations. And lighting. Yeah. I mean, it's lighting all got to be pointed so, in. So yeah. we'd have to have a C, uh, which would be odor. So, yeah, if we could see a draft that so, had the whole acting thing. Uh, so can I have a motion? Uh, a motion to direct okay. staff to or request staff. Yeah. Put a draft together and, and we'll refer to our April agenda. That's a motion. So moved. Second. Yeah. All in favor? Mm -hmm. All right. Madam Chair, I was remiss at the start of the meeting. Um, I'm blessed to have some great support with Larissa, and I'd like to transition at some point, and it, we should have done it tonight at the top of the show. To have Larissa be really kind of the lead yeah. um, staff support to this committee. Sure. I think you're in much more capable hands than, <laughs> than me. Um, so, if you don't mind, maybe we can invite her up to. Well, I was going to, to invite her well. anyway, and yeah, then I'm I, sitting here going, I oh, totally missed that piece. 
Um, Come on up. I'd like to continue to be involved. Uh, it's not to say you won't see me again, but... Um, but yeah, I think that's appropriate. That yeah. It doesn't require that two senior administrators be involved because she can get, she'll give you the benefit of it. Sure. No, we'll certainly collaborate on things, and to the extent my attendance is necessary, I'm pleased to be here. Um, and I think as the Bill and Will had witnessed last year, Lewis has done really the yeah, line share of the work for supporting the committee oh. already. So. I'm just looking at you. The, the, uh, said this uh, above a two has a three, four, five, three different descriptions, each with a little bit more. Is there... Is there a, a, a relevance to levels four or five? Because if you get above two, or, um, or is it just different ways of describing? I think it's different ways of describing to make sure that it's, there is a difference between an odor of such intensity that the air would be absolutely unfit to breathe. That's a level five. Yeah. And so you want to make sure that it's understood that you don't have to reach that level in order to warrant interference so and so let's define what those lower levels would look like while acknowledging that also if you happen to have something of that intensity that I think it was just an effort to really make clear the, the kind of the range of odors that there are and that make it clear to people where you feel where you have a right to kind of complain and and where you don't it, yeah, it just seems to me I don't know what relevance having four and five in once you get to three it's a moderate level that I think it just helps give it the just scale. Gives a scale. A frame of reference for yeah. you know, is this detectable and that I might notice or you know, modern intensity in does that. It does give it, it you it just helps you know a, a range itself. gives you perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And for so. a town that is more complex in its nature like Scarborough and with like I said much smaller lot lines, I think it would actually be reasonable to up that a little bit in some ways. I mean, it, Acton has most of the town is actually in five acre minimum right. lot sizes. Okay, so this is a very different standard to be applying. And so you can say, really, you got five acres, people. If at a lot line I hit a level two, if you're anything above that, we have a problem. Well, in Scarborough, if you're in a neighborhood with a right. half acre lot, maybe that level two standard is unreasonable to ask people to adhere to 100% of the time. And Scarborough wants yeah. to say instead, if you are, th if you are above three, that this is where an enforcement challenge comes in. Yeah. So, yeah, so when you're preparing, yeah. I'm assuming that you may be the staff that's preparing. I think I will work together with <laughs> Do you mind doing a little memo to that effect? Uh, not at all. That would be uh, awesome. Then we well, can talk yeah, about I mean, it next, the next meeting in April. She can take, you know, that and see yeah, why, exactly. where the differences in act in it. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. I mean, uh, we do that. Then we can chew on it. All right, next is, again, could, I'm going to... Could I just yeah, add go one ahead. thing, just as a cautionary note? Um, I think there were a couple of things that came through the ordinance committee last year that there was some unintended consequence that flowed mm, yeah. from. So I, I guess I just remind everyone that things often make sense uh, in the context oh, of this conversation. I, I don't mean to suggest that this odor conversation rises to that level, but I think this is something to be mindful of that... Oh, yeah, and that's um, why I like to try to get our agenda out there with the notes a week before sure. so the public can see if and, they're interested. The only reason I mentioned it is that a couple of those issues came to us from a single complaint, and though we've cited a number of situations here, this comes to you largely in the same context. So I right. just want to observe right. the law of unintended consequence that yeah. I don't think that there's something that we're not considering, but... Be well, that's it. that's it. Sometimes what you end up doing is you create more complaints right. that historically never the the neighbor didn't think it elevated itself quite to a complaint. Right. But then once the law's on the books, I mean, I'm thinking of barbecues and the occasional oh, backyard campfire, oh, and so I mean, there are you can see how. That's why I'm in no particular rush. Yeah. You know, I think it needs to be well thought out yeah. and, you know, discussed with fellow counselors, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. Well, thank you. I just want to... Yeah, no, no. That's, that that's an... Yeah, no. Absolutely. Uh, item five, um, I, I'm, again, I'm going to defer to uh, uh, Counselor Donovan. Um, I know I 
he worked very hard on the senior property tax relief program and he did a review and found that there may be a, an issue oh, yeah. that may take the, some this uh, just wordsmithing the, but I, I the audit that we did uh, discovered that there are people in mobile homes who get um, tax bills property tax bills for the property that uh, they live in which is a mobile home but frequently these mobile homes sit on leased land so, so you have a rental agreement with the owner of the mobile home park who will rent you your space, uh, your property, on which the mobile home is located. Uh, and we did not, our ordinance does not clearly take that account of that. So uh, in doing the audit, we deemed it uh, appropriate that it should that, but uh, whether the ordinance required amendment or not was the question. It is up in the air. It's up for debate whether it uh, deserves an amendment. Uh, in working with a person who I work with a lot, Craig Friedrich, on this, he did note that uh, in Section 5 of the ordinance, uh, it presently says the eligibility for renters reads, in case of renters, the tax assessed for purposes of Section 518, uh, one small i, shall be deemed to be 18% of the rent payable. Uh, and it was his suggestion that if it read, shall be uh, deemed to include 18% of the rent payable, uh, you would then, implicit in that language is that it, it includes the rent but it could also include the property tax bill, which clearly is, in fairness to somebody who has a land lease and a property tax bill for the, for the property itself, uh, the fair way to judge their eligibility. So that was the one change. Uh, I know that the town manager and I have talked about this. Uh, we've both said we were not uncomfortable giving advice and guidance to the assessing department town manager giving me advice since he oversees them, not me, uh, but with my support uh, to uh, have that be uh, the way in which they'd interpret the ordinance for the time being, regardless of whether we did anything. So that's the background. And to that end, uh, Bill and Craig put together a new application, and what's being distributed on the front page, you'll see at the top right, it says new on the back is the old one. So there were some modifications, I think, the last few numbered items, what, uh, 13, 14, 15, 16? There were some oh, changes yeah. to the application that will allow us to collect the necessary information to deal with the situation, so. Yeah, so if you're looking at the, uh, the form, line 10 says the real estate tax is assessed. That's on the old and that one. might be, uh, for a mobile home, might be $1,000. Uh, and then line 12 says tax attributed to rent, 18% of line 11, uh, which is the amount of rent. Uh, and so then uh, line 14 uh, adds them together. Uh, uh, and that's, so that's uh, clearly an appropriate way to uh, have a form that picks up both <coughs> the rental piece calculation, 18% of the rent, and the tax bill for the real property that's, uh, 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 that sits on the lot. Okay. And, and the logic here is that some percentage of the rent that they're paying is in effect paying their, the property tax right. of the, the actual owner yeah. of the, the land. Right. So therefore, it's really a pass-through that they weren't getting credit for right. Um, right. in this. I think that makes most Can sense. Can I, I have a question for the town manager. Um, it says real estate tax assessed, and is it technically personal property tax they're paying on their homes, or is it a real estate tax? That's it's a curiosity question. Estate. Okay, I'm yeah, just that's, curious. That, that's a good question and, and would uh, exclude if it was a personal okay. property that's tax. Yes, hey, yeah, totally. Absolutely. Okay. No, it's considered a, uh, okay. a real estate tax. Okay, cool, all right. Um, and again, Mr. Hall, I ask Mr. Hall this. Um, 
do we need to change the ordinance, or is it your belief that what we've got is fine and we can I, just move forward the way it is? I, I really think the modification to the application will address that situation, okay. and staff is comfortable, has been involved in this process, and uh, we actually today posted this form as the form to be used, and so I, I think that will effectively deal with that. If you wanted a fail-safe belt and suspenders it's an extremely modest change to the ordinance, but it would, uh, that's an approach too, but I don't think that's necessary. Okay. So it's kind of a moot point. Yeah, you could do it if you wanted to. If you, if you really wanted to uh, dot your I's, cross your T's, but if... Uh, I'm looking at Mr. Dot his I's and cross his <laughs> T's over here. <laughs> so it does appeal to uh, some of my more uh, uh, controlling tendencies to say, like, let's, <laughs> let's button it up and make the change. And Bill, could you just recall yeah, no, for us what that language change language. would be to oh. so yeah. section? Yeah, that would be five just that, uh, section five, uh, subsection two, uh, the first line, mm -hmm. uh, where what it reads, uh, shall be deemed to be 18 percent, would read shall be deemed to include 18 percent so change b to include right there just that do just, you have to put that well, no I, I, okay. I was working on this earlier oh, okay. and then i said okay, sorry. let me let me go ask uh tom if he remembered just one the, yeah well, i didn't change he problem. didn't so i then went That's asked strange. craig friedrich uh, uh, who was the person who made this suggestion and he did recall it so that's the only change. It's simple, and yeah. uh, it is something that we could pass to the uh, town council without, uh, would not be much fuss. Right. But it would make it clear and be consistent with the new form. And it wouldn't just be the advice of uh, the town manager, uh, his opinion, uh, or the town council chair's input to the town manager. and, and asking the assessing department to do it, but it would make it the clear policy of the town. Would you like to make a motion? Yeah, I'll move, we uh, amend section five, subsection two, entitled eligibility for renters, to uh, uh, strike uh, the word B that follows the words shall be deemed to, uh, and uh, replace it with the word include. So shall we strike be deemed to? Shall we deem to include 18% or shall we? Shall include. I, I don't think it changes the meaning either way. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't think it changes it either way. Okay. Yeah, so, so it's your, your preference. Yeah, I think probably shall include, uh, strike the words, be deemed to be. To the motion. So the motion yeah. would be... Uh, Second. All in favor? That's... There you go. We have a chance to get this on your next agenda. Would you like it to be appear in first reading? That's a I'm looking at you. So please. <laughs> okay. So it'll be on the March 21st agenda. Thank you. Okay. Next we have moorings. It's going to be that season. <laughs> Being a boat owner myself, I know that this is a perennial issue <coughs> everywhere. <laughs> yeah, this is an issue. Yeah, um, I do have, I, I don't believe you have a copy of the um, memo from, it's from Tracy uh, and, and Toadie. And it just says, it has come to our attention that there are issues with mooring permits. We are aware that people are not using their moorings. We've also heard that mooring owners are subletting their mooring, which is not allowed under the current ordinance. Some suggestions would be, one, to show proof of registering their boat, and two, have the harbor master check to see if current mooring holders are actually using their moorings. 
Our mooring waiting list currently has 81 people. Well, it's down. Waiting for moorings in the town of Scarborough. Some of these people have been on for 10 or more years. If we could tighten up the ordinance, maybe we could issue more moorings for those on the waiting list. Um, our harbor master, Mr. Anderson, is here. If you would, yeah, come over and chat with us a little about this. Sure. All right. So first off, I'd, I would like to say I agree with everything both Tracy and Tody have in the mm -hmm. memo here. Um, I think proof of boat registration would be a big step in the right direction. And a lot of towns do require that. Mm -hmm. I believe Portland found with some others. So th there is, that concept is very well established. Um, <coughs> one other thing that I've thought of, and again, a lot of other towns do, and that we don't do, is we have no fee on our wait list. The wait list is free to apply to. You apply every, I believe it's every two years. Oh. Um, a lot of towns, Freeport, uh, Falmouth, Yarmouth, I believe, are all ten dollars to apply. You pay that fee every year or biannually, depending on what your your reapplication rate is. No fee for moorings. Uh, not for the wait list. The mooring, we do have a mooring fee. Oh, okay. But there's no fee to be on the wait list. Um, I think that could could help quite a bit. Part of the issue we run into enforcement wise, as far as unused moorings or uh, particularly subletting of moorings is that you not only have to prove that the other boat was on their mooring because that is allowed per our ordinance but you have to prove that money or goods were exchanged um, that's sort of the issue you run into proving that you know recreationally caught lobsters are sold things of that nature um, it can be very tricky to prove that any exchange of of money was ever ever done um, and I, I would hesitate to get rid of that that clause that you could allow other people to use your mooring I, I think that would be a mistake uh, one can I, can yeah, I ask absolutely. you why you think that would be a mistake well if you have you know for example you have somebody has a riparian mooring right in front of their house and yeah. they keep their boat on it year round yeah. or close to year round through the whole season they pull their boat for a week and they have family come in yeah. anything like that you know, if they're from Massachusetts, they sail up, they can use their mooring for a week. There's no exchange of currency or anything right. like that, and that's allowed. And that sort of allowance is something that, that a lot of people respect, a lot of people like. Um, now, <coughs> my thought would be that we could possibly limit that hmm. to say either, you know, a non-registered or a boat that isn't registered to that mooring could be on there for, say, a week or right. 14 days, whatever the choice may be. Um, but currently there's no limit on how long only that the registered boat has to be on there for 30 days out of the year which can be another tough enforcement point other than going out and you know marking down on the checklist everybody who's on their boat to, on their mooring today or or something right. to that effect chucking tires so to speak because the mooring balls at least our mooring balls yep. have an identification they on do my, my I've got uh, moorings are from Peaks Island. Yep, sure. And um, sure. I know there's identification, you know, whatever on them. Um, and yeah, you have, we have to have proof of registration of the boat and whatnot. Right. And right. I can't just allow any Joe Schmo to come and use my mooring. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think without the notifying is, the harbor master. Right. I can notify the harbor right. master that, well, I'm allowing Cousin Susie to keep their boat on the Absolutely. mooring. And that, that clause is in our ordinance as well, that they have to notify me. Um, but still, that puts no limit on how long another boat right. is there. Um, Do you find that people are complying with that? Are they notifying you? And Generally speaking, um, at, least, you know, at least in the river, you know, where it's, I'm down there every day and, and it's a little harder to hide. There we do have some more moorings up to, you know, up to clay pits when it's neck over, um, even over in Spurwink. Right. That, you know, to be honest, probably don't they don't get checked as often as our our main channel moorings do. Um, given those are a much smaller percentage of our 254 moorings, but holds true. So uh, one thing I've just to make the committee aware, one thing I've undertaken uh, to try and 
move towards fixing this is um, in the process of working with an online mooring company to move all of this digitally so that I can actually access oh. it from the water right. and, and to do all of our paperwork through them. Ease right. mooring application and, and things of that nature take a lot of the load off the town clerk's office. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you can set that up to require all kinds of things, payment, proof of registration, everything of that nature. So uh, that should make enforcement quite a bit easier, too. Do they have that in Portland and South Portland? That, it's actually the same the same program they use in Portland. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Portland, Falmouth. Um, I think their biggest harbor is Nantucket, which is 2,200 moorings. Yeah. But even just in towns around us, there. How many moorings do we have? We have 254. Wow. Yep. Okay. Yep. So we are. It is sizable. Um, we compare to towns like Yarmouth and Freeport and Falmouth. Mm -hmm. Well, not Falmouth. Falmouth has to the tune of 1,200. Yeah, I was going to say yeah, Anchorage. Found, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, do we have the ability to expand the number of moorings, or is that it? I wouldn't say by any great degree. Um, I think pursuing this and being able to organize them a, a little more neatly will open up a couple of spots, and we do have a couple available. Um, but I would say maybe to the tune of ten to fifteen additional, not we wouldn't be able to in any big swath add in 75 people from the wait list. And, and part of that is because we have to allow for the way the river changes, um, contrary to places like Portland and hard bottom harbors. We don't have the luxury of being able to use every inch of water that we have in the course of a year from when they dredge. In the course of a storm, sometimes, we can lose a lot of possible bottom. So you go down there at high tide and it looks like you can can fit everybody you want. But huh. We actually have fairly limited bottom. Yeah. The uh, prevalence of, of uh, renting your, you know, not having a boat on it, uh, is, is it that they just don't use it or that they're renting it? Where's the, where's the biggest problem? Hmm. I, I think the biggest issue would be lack of use by the registered owner. I, I'm confident that there are people renting them. Um, and that's something I, I plan to pursue a little heavier this summer as I fall into my third summer here and kind of finally have my feet about me. Um, but I would say that the biggest issue is, is a lack of use and so people would, get them, hang on to them forever with no boat. And would, would people uh, register them but still not put their boat on the mooring itself? And pay for it. Yep, they, because they, they register and pay for it. Because they would just say it's a, it's a cost I want to incur to maintain the right. To make sure that they have it, absolutely. So, yep. they, so they may have a boat in their yard or something to that show effect. So proof of registration, it, that, that might help some, yep. but the real problem is to make them put a registered boat on it. Right. But I think if you... If you limited it to people that have actively registered boats for the right. upcoming year, I think you would get rid of a large portion of that. You have people, really all they need is a set of registration numbers, which may very well be from 2011, 12, 13. Yeah. And they, they register the mooring with that boat. Yeah. And then 10 years down the line, they haven't registered the boat. It's still in their yard, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Because I, I think I had heard um, the idea that uh, some places require you to have your boat uh, on the mooring mm -hmm. by June 1st, June 15th, July 1st, yep. Yep. Uh, and that that's an effective way. <clears throat> I, I would have to agree, absolutely. That, that's certainly something I would support. Yes. Yep. Um, so that, to me, I could see making them register it, making them have it come be, be actually out there in use by a date certain. Right. Uh, and they do offer in the ordinance it does allow for discretion if they contact me as far as true. family illnesses, mm -hmm. right. sure. boat right. maintenance issues, things like right. that. So um, that's sort of the workaround too if something happens and they can't make that date. Ian, how so. many more? I know we've got all these registrations for moorings, sure. but people pull their moorings or they should be having them inspected yep. whatever, on a regular basis. Um, how many of them are actually in the water 
and not in the water, but they still have a license. You know, they've got this registered I, mooring, and they aren't even out there. I would say that every mooring there is is out okay. there. Okay. Yep. All right. Yeah, we do have we have, do have quite a few balls, right? And, okay. Yeah. I do have a question. It yeah. does strike me in this age of Airbnb that I think we're fooling ourselves if yeah. there isn't a convenient mm -hmm. online way of the sailing public to know where they can pick up a mooring for a night. It's interesting that you bring that up because <laughs> uh, last week, Wednesday through Friday, I was at the Maine Harbor Masters Conference. We go up for three days and cover a number of issues, that being the newest one. Um, back to Falmouth, they ran into that this year. And ah. One of the marinas, within their rights, started going through Airbnb to try and rent out moorings. They're marina-owned moorings, so right. they're, they're allowed to do that. Uh, but it seems that that kind of caught on, and they're looking mm -hmm. to figure out how to limit that. And yeah, in accordance be, with the trying to... It could to, be extremely lucrative. Someone could simply have mm -hmm. the mooring never Absolutely. put their own personal vessel on it yep. and just running it up. Well, what they're, dollars, what they're so. running into is people are leaving their personal boat on it and renting the boat. Uh, the, exactly. I know Absolutely. exactly so, one person who's doing yeah. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other question I have is uh, how, how I, I'm thinking of our, our mooring field, and are our moorings, moorings assigned based on size of vessel? Is it limited? We do our best to do that. Yeah, there are certain areas um, that comes to mind. If you pull down the pier right next to our, or pull down the ramp rather next to the pier, and look right to the right, we have a handful of boats in there that are in the, you know, 18 to 25 foot range, and there are a number of boats right off the front of the pier, the, the commercial boats. To Councilor Donovan's point, that I wonder if there. there's some efficiencies that we could, you know, tighten up the existing yep. field. Um, you know, obviously need to account Absolutely. for proper swing of, of vessels so there's no, yep. they're not contacting each other, but. Um, how often, if at all, do we do any kind of comprehensive? Because you assign particular longitude, latitude, GPS yep. coordinates. Yes, we do. Yep. Stone. Okay. And that is that is something that, again, I'm, I'm actually looking to pursue with this this mapping program right. because they have a calculator based in there for, you know, um, what they call snoot line, the line between your mooring ball and the boat, the length of the boat, and it'll show a swing room for every vessel in your harbor, mm -hmm. and so you can actually do more of a comprehensive plan. You can really maximize the efficiency right. of the, uh, the right. field. Right. And I, I think that mainly is where we would get those 10 to 15 moorings that we could add in. Um, it is it is a fairly limited channel oh, because yeah. you, at the same time you are trying to maintain a navigation way uh, through the mooring field also. Uh, uh, I particularly like how you get the vessels pointing in, in all in the same direction. Yeah, it, it <laughs> takes a lot of coordination. It, it takes a lot of coordination. No. <laughs> they're, they're good. I put the memo out every morning. All the guys. Yeah, twice, twice, right? <laughs> twice a day. Twice a day. Exactly. Do you have any so, questions, I, Mr. Rollins? So my understanding, though, is currently in the ordinance, we do have a probation on subletting. Yes, yeah. we do. Yep. And it's just nope, we would need, active. So what we're looking for are tools to help arm you so that you can help enforce yes. some of these. Uh, okay. And then how long did you say the wait list was? How many how many boats are on it? Are 81. 81 at the moment. Yeah. yeah. And what, what kind of turnover do we, do we typically see on an annual? I would say less than five per year. Okay. And yeah. consistently, yeah. Long. And if and if we were to have a fee to be on the waiting list, what would the consequence of that be? Mm -hmm. Would that cause somebody to say, I've been on the waiting list all these years, and now I've got to pay to wait for another 10 years? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that I understand. Yep. The value of charging somebody to be on a waiting list that isn't moving. Sure, um, I think I think in some towns they actually use it as a method to get the wait list to move. You have people that put in applications who own no boat and, mm -hmm. quite frankly, sure. possibly don't have an intention of owning a boat, but would like to get. But a because boat. it's free, they can they can hope to get the more. So they, they move up the line eventually. They get it and right. And they rent and, it out. And go from there. Then they rent it out. <laughs> then they rent it out. So uh, it's an interesting conundrum. So uh, if we were going to entertain <clears throat> um, restrictions that might address some of these problems, it would be to make the boats be on the mooring by a date certain, make the boats be registered mm -hmm. by a date certain, uh, 
fees for being on the wait list. Uh, and we already have a prohibition against the rental of moorings. And I would, I would say possibly a, a limit to the length of time they're allowed to be on the mooring. Just in ordinance, say, seven days. This oh, is how for, much for, 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 a, for a borrowing. Yeah, allowing a right. Do, do we have something that requires uh, a length of time for the registered boat to be on it? I heard, I thought 30 it was, days. It yep. Currently. Out, out of the year. Out of the year. And that's currently in the year. 30 days. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Any other questions for Mr. Anderson? Oh, no, this is good. No, yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you guys. Yeah. Looking forward to the new year here. And yeah. <laughs> kind of tackling some of this. So. Do you have a suggestion as to the number of days that uh, a visitor, uh, a, a guest, could use the mooring? I. I'm of the opinion seven days would be yeah. appropriate, and then they could appeal. The they, or something. Yeah, they could appeal to me for or appeal for an extension. Right like for yeah. extension or anything like that. Good. And, and I'm thinking too that they should notify. They should just give a notification to the harbor master that, by the way, uh, my boat yep. catnip isn't going to be on the morning for seven days because I'm allowing the MV, whatever, yeah. to use it, and that's my brother's sure. boat or whatever. No. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Could there be, please at any point tell me that I have crossed the line between <laughs> the policy assistant and Paul. Like, anyway, could there be a, not a, a permit associated with the, like, if I'm going to have guests up and I want them to be able to clam, mm -hmm. I have the opportunity for a temporary clamming permit, right? Mm -hmm. So could there be, or is that expanding government to a place we don't want it to be, but like, could there be not just a notification, but the proof of notification is that they've actually secured a permit for their guest mooring. Mm -hmm. So idea, I've got a guest coming, I can secure a permit for a week at a time. So if I do have a sibling that's coming to come up and they're going to be there a month, because sailors that are sailing around, right. that's not an unusual thing to need to have. Right. right. I can right. just continue to request a permit. Yeah, and I but it's enforce. It's I think that would be more enforceable because if you see yeah. something out there and there isn't a permit, yep. then you know yep. right away that they have that it's not a question of them simply not notifying him. They didn't. They didn't. They didn't the apply permit. for the permit. Right. right. That's an idea. And it could be an yeah. online permitting, so it's not something that's going to burden sure. the town's clerk's office. Sure. I wonder if it would tie into the software program. I wonder what that has to offer. Yeah, you can do. I I've looked at some of their examples before in in their bigger towns where they have numerous different permits but they do everything right down to pump out stations and oh, wow. and things of that nature you can run it all right through that system so huh. uh, that would that would be more than capable of handling that idea is is the system ordered the software program ordered yet no 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 I, I've been talking with a rep recently um, the way that they it's a an annual fee based on the number of permits you run through it so it's six dollars a permit and that permit would be either um, either your mooring permit fees or your wait list permits. So I know towns, I think it's Southwest Harbor, yeah. they do all of their active moorings through there, but mm -hmm. they have a wait list similar to ours. They choose to keep that in-house so they don't pay for that. Okay. But that would be the... You know. Is it your intention to make a recommendation to the town manager for the purpose of the upcoming budget? That's my plan, my hope. Um, I'm, I'm hoping to pursue that here shortly. So. <laughs> Looking at the manager. Well, that's worth, it's timely. Yep, yeah, and it, it's something that I've only been working on for a very short period of time here. Yeah. So I, it I sounds wish I could like, give you like more info. Plan. It sounds like the next step to effectively right. deal with mooring permits. I think so. Is to, is to introduce a, a state-of-the-art system. And now just a question, what, what is that cost? Right. But it's going to be a lot more efficient for you it, it certainly is. It, it makes my job easier down there anyway, and takes and a, a lot sounds of like enforcement off the, the town be clerk office. Substantially improved. Yeah. All right. All right. Anything else? Sorry. The harbor master? Mm -hmm. So we can let him go back and master the harbor? <laughs> <laughs> thank thank you, right. you very much. Well, thank much. you very much. But, but, but I think, I think the. There's a whole series of things that we should. Yeah. This should needs do. Some more work, obviously. Yeah, and I think you know, we've kind of listed off the ones that seem most obvious, mm -hmm. and maybe Larissa would be charged with a draft that would be brought back to the next meeting. Yeah, mm -hmm. is that a motion? That is a motion. Okay. 
So I'll, I'll second that. Um, for discussion, though, um, do we want to try and target? I mean, just because time is short, it's already getting on toward spring, almost. Uh, do we want to try and target this summer, or are we really looking for changes to be in effect? Most, pe most people don't put their boats in. We are unusual. Ours is going in in two weeks. But That's very unusual. Yes, I know, but don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, most people put theirs in uh, Memorial Day, right? More or less. Around that area, yeah. yeah. No, um, my only point would be through the town clerk's office. I believe you guys have already issued more internal renewables. So this would be for so, next year? Yeah. Okay. So, All right. That gives yeah. us a little more time. Yeah, so it gives us the urgency might be a little yeah. more okay. and, and that way, any updates can be put out with the new uh, renewal notices. You know, is, is there likely to be any backlash? You heard us talking earlier about unintended consequences. <laughs> uh, oh, there will be. And we've done some ordinance work that we had no expectation that there would be a backlash signage. Sure. And, and, and we got people feeling like we were taking their First Amendment rights away. So, What if we did something about inviting interested parties, letting them know that this, this is going to be on the agenda, and making sure they know certain groups of people? Yeah. Um, the only thing that I really, obviously, with any new fee, and I'm not saying we need to pursue that fee, right. it's just an option. With any new fee, you do get backlash. Um, there's nothing that jumps out to me as an issue. Uh, we're kind of falling in line with a lot of other larger municipalities, and the way things are done in a lot of towns. So, and done with success. Yeah. yeah, I think I could accurately predict either if you institute a new waitlist fee, I think you will get some people yes. upset. Uh, equally, if you do something to just imagine folks that for a year, you know, maybe 10 years, have been dutifully paying their fee and not doing anything with it, right. uh, that suggests to me a level of commitment and interest on their part. Right. So if you're going to take that away from them, there might be... Well, was the, Some concern. obviously we've got names on the regis registered warrants to notify them that we're going to be discussing this if you wanted to go down that route. Yeah, we send out. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a captive audience. We know who they <laughs> so yeah, yeah, We have 254 yeah. people with Plus 81. moorings, yeah. names and addresses, and then I would we appreciate got 80, that. 81, 81 oh, people list. on the on the wait list. So there's a capacity of 90 people to, in this room. They won't all service. show up, but we'll get emails. And stuff. Oh, we can, and we can also <laughs> explain the proposal and ask right. for feedback. Right. But yeah, the, right. We might have suggested that we wait till there's something tangible so, right, exactly. right. before we right. invite yeah. input. But I think that it makes sense to get them yeah. involved once we have something. Yeah. All right, we have a motion and a second on the table that I haven't forgotten about, which is to move this to Marissa's going to. Come up with some language we can start working with yeah. and move it to April meeting. Good. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you so much, folks. Thanks, Ian. Oh, my goodness, where are we? Affordable rent. What the heck are we talking about here? Tom said, I don't know if we need this to go to ordinance. So I don't even know what we're talking about. Don't so yeah. I know yeah. you sent me Let's, something, but. Sure. Um, so just if. You permit me to introduce it? Please. Great. So at the <laughs> um, at our last uh, Housing Alliance meeting, uh, we had a um, uh, developer of um, property that uh, had taken an affordable density bonus, and his obligation was to, um, to rent um, an affordable unit. Uh, and he had some questions about exactly how he could um, how he should be uh, interpreting the ordinance. Because he had originally interpreted it to, to be that he could set his rent uh, based on someone with an income at 80% of the area median income, uh, which has a very specific definition for the greater Portland area. Um, but our, um, our ordinance reads that, um, that the rent um, does not exceed 30%, including uh, utility and energy costs, does not exceed 30% of the household's gross monthly income. Um, 
which then suggests that it varies by uh, individual renting the unit. That's um, paragraph B. That is in paragraph B. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and so the uh, we have some some individuals on Scarborough Housing Alliance that are engaged in the affordable housing industry, um, and uh, the belief was that that we that what we're really intending is um, in order to make this practical, it really you really have to give the landlords a way to be to know what their rent is going to be, so mm -hmm. that they can run their uh, pro formas for for how the, this you know their whole mm -hmm. complex is going to be uh, profitable for them, um, and so the 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 thought is that you need to find uh, an individual that um, uh, earns less than the area median income for their household size, um, and then um, even though they're they're they may be paying more than thirty percent at first, mm -hmm. while their income rises, you then don't kick them out and or start to make them pay full uh, rent um, when they exceed that eighty percent of AMI. You give them kind of a grace period. Whereby they're kind of getting on their feet now. They're now they can start to maybe put some um, uh, money away so that they're you know they're not using um, the affordable, the limited affordable slot forever. Um, and so the the language this language was drafted by uh, one of the committee members, um, Eric Boucher, um, and um, uh, it does just that. Okay. Do you have any questions? He also provided a couple of Mr. examples. Mr. Donovan. And, and the uh, underlined provisions here are the new language? Yes, underlined uh, underline are new, and the strikeouts are the removal of the old language. Mr. Hall, did you yeah, get I, a chance uh, to look at the... I did. And Does it make sense? Frankly, I, we, we rushed this onto your agenda just because the opportunity presented it. I think this was uh, done just last week at uh, committee level. Um, there's really not tremendous urgency in that this one developer has actually moved ahead, made arrangements with this one tenant that would qualify under this definition, and has said, I'll assume the risk. Um, so it looks like we don't have immediate pressure to, to do this. And the only reason I, I mention that is that uh, this drafting has the example, and I know from that oh, past right. experience, and I wish I had caught it earlier, the town attorney is often frowned on this sort of huh. language. Mm. Yeah. Um, I've seen it done as kind of a citizen's note or kind of parenthetical. Right. So it, it because it serves a very helpful, important, pur important purpose for people to understand how it works, but it really shouldn't be language that's officially part of the ordinance. This is Chapter 405 of our zoning ordinance. Mm -hmm. So that's the only thing I'd flag is that kind of example isn't something you necessarily want to be adopted as part of the actual ordinance language mm -hmm. and have legal effect. Yeah. Uh, but it is hugely helpful at the same time. So I don't know if we can do it as a you do, citizen's Do they note. do it as footnotes? I don't think we've done that. Again, I've seen it characterized in other towns as, uh, they call them citizen's notes, uh, or maybe just examples, but they're not officially part of the uh -huh. legal substance of the ordinance. It's it, useful. It? Yeah, it's a shame because it really is helpful to understand. Right. For mm. the uninitiated to pick it up and understand actually but how some, it makes sense. But of someone this. would take it literally, so to speak. Right. Like someone now. 10 years yeah. from now will say, yeah. well, oh, 13, yeah, exactly. 11, 50, that does, you know, right. I, that's, I can't do that. Well, right. Mm. And the numbers will have changed and be outdated in terms of the right. limits. In this reference to the 17 does, income yeah. limits, obviously those will change each and every year. So, But is the wording under, the, under Section B, other than the as an example, does that, that, that make sense? I believe that does it. I have a question about that wording. Uh, and I think I'm just not reading the sentence correctly. But how does the words based on rental unit size, so how does that tie into the, the are there guidelines the, with gui the number of people yeah. and the yeah, number exactly. of Yeah, exactly. The, the okay. number in the household, okay. the, the, yeah. then the AMI changes based on. Right. So uh, I can't have a two bedroom unit with a six member family. And right, right, okay. right, and I'm wondering if that actually needs more definition. I know that yeah, I think it's might going to be my suggestion. <coughs> yep. Um, okay. I I also wonder if there isn't. I, I don't really want to mutter it, muddy it too much, but um, if there are, if we don't need to do something similar in section A, um, so I wonder. Uh, I wonder if we should. Yeah, I might, yeah, I might suggest let's 
table. I don't think there's great urgency, and it mm. would make perfect, perfect sense to send it back to committee for further work. Yeah. Um, you could come back here, or you could be comfortable that they'll clean it up and it could go straight to council at that point. Okay. Okay. Do you I, have a motion? I'll move. So, but only, well, for, we this, only for discussion. I'm oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Be my guess. Uh, move that it be sent back to the committee for to work on the points raised at the in this discussion. Yeah, I'll second. Second. Uh, yeah, because I, I it, just reading it, it's it's a little hard to get your arms around. Yeah. I I need I need some. Mm -hmm. Need some more wordsmithing in this. Will pointed out it may open up something else in another part of the. So I think having it go back to committee because they're the experts on the affordable housing stuff. So we need it to go yeah. back to them. That's a, we're very fortunate to have the expertise on that committee. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Uh, uh, and, and that and cleaning up the example. Yes. Uh, however, we right. need to. Uh, right. uh, and, a, and, and and basing. You, Maybe also further explaining the, the rental unit size. So we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Just clarifying, is there an expectation that it comes back to this group, to ordinance, after the Housing Alliance? Or should it go right to the council? I, I, my personal opinion is that it, whatever that committee comes up with, I, I would be less comfortable changing here from the from the ordinance committee so I think we might just be passing it through okay. to be honest um, but I would yes, prefer to that makes yeah. sense to me you're comfortable yeah. that you you if you have to introduce the item that you, you I'll can effectively it. explain it I I would someone not, I would will not explain want to have it to me so I can explain it to whomever okay no, but that's good but it's going to come out of affordable housing. Well, it's not going to come out of ordinance. So I'm not worried about it. <laughs> That's true. That's true. That would fall to Will. That's right. That's right. So very well said. All right. Um, All right. The next agenda items for next month. Then it looks like we're going to uh, have odor, mooring, and then we have a, a new issue. That's it's minor in my opinion, but we'll see. It's parking by Scarborough Beach. There's some uh, going on about who parks where and what's no parking in any way. Tom and I have been working on it, so. Really? Stay tuned. Park, beach parking. <laughs> you mean right no, on? No, on the street. On Black yeah. Point Road? Yes. yes, on Black Point Road. Is, who's bringing that forward? Oh, uh, uh, well, we've had Jean Marie got in the middle of a brouhaha down there one day when I went down to the beach. Yeah, don't ask. There's a new owner across the street uh, in a little art gallery. No, 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 this is up, this is the end, well, the entrance to Scarborough Beach, yeah. right? You know, you go in and yeah. they've got the gate and whatever. Yeah. Well, there's been posted some no parking and anyway, what, what we're looking at is potentially putting no parking like from 40 feet down from a point, I don't know if it'll be in the middle of the parking on either side, no. Because they, they really screw around with that parking because sometimes right. they'll have you line up uh, uh, against traffic mm -hmm. on, the, on the shoulder. Uh, because what they don't want people to do is to get in line to go down past the entrance way and then go around, turn around, and then come back and get in line. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah. they, I, I, it's just awkward. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, okay. stay tuned. All right. Okay. And that's mm -hmm. it. Do Good. I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Three. Mm -hmm. One, two, three. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That was good.